All righty. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see you all here and for us to be in person doing this again. This is the third Alzheimer's Advocacy Day that I've organized since being with the organization. My name's Meg Polite, for those of you who don't know me. And um, last year, we had the honor of using the Lieutenant Governor's Office as our spot because there's no more rooms for public meetings in the State House. It was very cramped. I don't know if you all have seen the photo of that, but we did have, I don't know, 30 or 40 people inside his office um, trying to mingle. And um, yes, it's very small space. So this year, I invited him to join us to give us some opening remarks about advocacy and about the legislative session. So we're going to start with a few marks from, remarks from our Lieutenant Governor, David Zuckerman. Yeah, I try to open my office to, to groups of folks to meet, but I think we've learned maybe 35 or 40 is a little too many to fit. Um, and I also just want to, uh, I know you're going to be with Meg a lot today, and many of you have known Meg uh, now for a few years in her role. Uh, I go back a long ways with Meg, and um, I am sad to have lost her amazingness, but I'm really glad that you have her amazingness. But you've probably learned it already. You'll continue to learn it. But let's give Meg a round of applause for all the work she does. I, I really think these advocacy days are a critical piece of how things get done in Vermont, how change happens, how you're speaking up either as folks with Alzheimer's and different forms of dementia, as well as uh, caregivers and friends and folks that are in the orbit uh, that so many people are in, uh, making sure your legislators learn more about it, understand the needs that people have, uh, the challenges that people have, uh, bringing your voice to the state house will make a difference it doesn't always happen overnight politics is slow um, but these advocacy days are really important so i'm glad you're you're out being a part of it i am um, i've learned a lot more about alzheimer's uh, since meg's involvement um, and and the events in my office but also the information coming to me uh, i've been at a couple of the Shelburne walks uh, to meet with many of you who have been up at that particular uh, walk in, in the fall. Um, so learning more and more, learning a lot about uh, how many hours of unpaid care many people give as family members, as spouses or siblings or children um, and, and just loved ones. Uh, millions of hours across the country, I believe uh, I was told 28 million. Um, and, you know, we as a society, I think, need to shift how we operate and the expectation of what people can do when you're trying to work and afford housing and afford food and also uh, have that kind of time commitment. So um, there's so many different aspects uh, to, to this that as governance, we need to be looking at. Um, you know, it's important, as I, as I said earlier, in terms of your advocacy, you know it. Um, and this is something I say to farmers. This is something I say to teachers. This is something I say to engineers. Most of those legislators are not as knowledgeable about your topic as you are. Each of us are humans. We each know our world. You know, I'm a farmer. I've been in politics a long time, so I've learned a lot about a number of things. But each person who's a legislator knows their world, knows their family experience, knows their occupational experience, uh, knows their life experience. But none of us know everything by any means. And you are the experts. And they have no staff. Uh, so you, as their constituents, are their library of information. You are their expert to go to. So develop those relationships, not just today, but then you know, foster that. Um, over time, and that will have an impact as legislators learn more, know more, and then when the subject matter comes up, they go, oh yeah, I know Daryl, and, uh, and Daryl is telling me about you know, this factor or that factor, and they'll, they'll be more um, attuned to the issues. Um, another, another aspect of what you do by coming to the State House regularly, as well as the walks, and, and being present and visible in your work is destigmatizing uh, Alzheimer's and, and dementia. It's like so many, I mean, thankfully, 
we are, um, I think, in a sort of an awakening moment of destigmatization of many, many different um, parts of our society. Um, but so many folks still live very, very wonderful lives after a diagnosis, and some folks think it's an, it's immediate, it's all it's all over, um, and it's clearly a very traumatizing and and difficult diagnosis to receive. But it also doesn't mean everything stops, and and helping destigmatize um, people's expectations, other people's expectations of folks with Alzheimer's and dementia, um, is really really important. Um, so thank you for doing that, you know, as we're breaking down these different walls and barriers in different ways. Uh, and one of the really good things about the, the topic you are um, sadly working on is that it doesn't matter what the person's politics are. And there's a lot of issues that get very partisan very fast. You want to talk about taxes? Partisanship. You want to talk about certain social services? Partisanship. Um, my wife is afflicted with Lyme disease. It's another one of those kinds of things where uh, folks of all walks of life become afflicted. And uh, therefore, every legislator is a possible supporter for you. And so don't, uh, don't push someone to the side thinking, oh, because of their politics on some other topic may or may not agree with where you might be. You really can um, make an impact with every single legislator, and we can get every single legislator across the partisan worlds uh, in this highly partisan moment in time uh, to be supportive of your efforts. So um, keep working on it. I know there was a bill that passed the Senate. I think it's in the House now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so there's, the ball is rolling. Uh, we've got about six weeks left to get that ball across the finish line. Um, and I know Meg's been working really hard on that and your work today is gonna be really helpful for that. So welcome to the Universalist State House. And, um, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing Daryl later on the Senate floor and I hope your day is really uh, productive and effective. So thank you. Alrighty. Thank you so much to Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman for always encouraging us to be bold with our voices. And I, I don't know if he knows or if all of you know, but one of the things we talk about, he was mentioning um, dementia and Alzheimer's being nonpartisan, is that the red and blue of the Dems and Republicans come together as purple. And that's why we proudly wear our purple out there as a nonpartisan um, color to represent um, that this does, as you said, touch people of all walks of life, all parts of the country, the state, the world, and unfortunately a lot of different ages, actually all ages if you consider the impact on children who have parents with dementia or grandchildren. Um, so it, it was an appropriate comment to make at the end and I'm happy he highlighted it for us. I just want to make sure that you all have seen there's an agenda in front of you. We're going to have um, three PowerPoint presentations right now in the first part before we take a break to sort of lay the groundwork of some of the work that's been done and some of the work that's in progress right now. Then we'll take a break and after the break we're going to have a few advocates on a panel that are going to lead us into a group brainstorm about what we need what we need as organizations, what we need as individuals, as care partners, as people living with the disease, um, and what we can offer as advocates and organizations. So as the Lieutenant Governor said, there's a lot that you all do, that we all do together, that is really part of the solution because destigmatization de and awareness raising is a huge piece of getting in front of this. Um, and there's other things that people do as well, activities that they're planning in their communities, support they're giving, events they're holding at their churches. So the second half will be around brainstorming, like what do we need and how can we come together as a group to do that? So. Um, I did make a few copies of the PowerPoints. I know some people, I made five copies. I know some people, especially Pamela, who have trained me well, likes those, so I'm going to pass those out. Um.
All right, so Kirk, you can go to the next slide. I wanted to start just by introducing you all to the Alzheimer's staff. I'm not sure if you know all of us. As a matter of fact, um, when we were planning for this event, I had a meeting with advocates that sort of helped me think through, like, what kinds of things do people want and need in this level setting time? And one of the first things was, please go over who's who and what they do. <laughs> so um, the next few slides are going to talk about the people in our organization and also the partners that we work most closely with and sort of remind you of the acronyms because there's a lot of them. So first of all, for our office, our executive director, Howard Goodrow, is in the back if you haven't met him before. Um, you know me, I'm the policy director. We have Jo Cotto back by our program table. She does the program, so that means the education programs, the support groups out in the community, the awareness, that's, that's um, what Jo is overseeing, facilitating, finding volunteers for, et cetera. Um, then we have two development managers, Jenna Johnson, who's not here today. She oversees the Champlain Valley Walk and the Northeast Kingdom Walk, as well as our um, Camel's Hump Challenge, which is a backcountry ski adventure that unfortunately did not happen this year because the snow did not cooperate. And Jasmine, who's in the very back, Averbuck, um, she's our development director that focuses more on the central and southern part of the state with the Rutland Walk and the Upper Valley Walk and um, also the Longest Day and our Reason to Hope Gala, which you'll hear a little bit more about. And then we have Kirk sitting in the front up here, um, and uh, administrative associate does not do justice to what Kirk does because he does literally everything, supporting our communications, all of our social media, and helping all of us do our jobs, and we're extraordinarily grateful for him. Um, and Kirk came to us as an intern and was part of our very first advocacy day here in the role of an intern and then came to our organization and i mentioned that because we have two interns in the room um rebecca and maddie we have five interns working with our organization right now and one of the activities that they did to help us with the destigmatization and outreach and awareness was to have an event for three days last week in the Davis Center at the University of Vermont where they were engaging students in this. So you see flowers up above us of students that wrote messages about their own personal connections to dementia as they pass that table. So um, we really, really rely on the interns to help us with the capacity, particularly around um, delivering programs, helping with the advocacy and leading in caregiver support groups. So thank you both and to all the interns who aren't here um, as well. Okay, the next slide, we're gonna go to our state partners. We have two big state partners. The first one is called Dale, the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. We have several representatives from Dale here right now, the acting commissioner. Megan Tierney Ward is here. Tiffany is also here, whose name you see, and you'll hear from her later. Um, and you see Angela smith Jang, who's the director of the Adult Services Division, and Jason Pal Palapita, who's the director of the State Unit on Aging. So the way I kind of, the, the, this is like the oversimplification, but Dale is the place in the state of Vermont that provides the services that older Vermonters and caregivers of people with dementia and, and disabilities and, and other things need, but for our purpose, older Vermonters need. So they are the ones that help to run the programs and oversee the funding that comes in from the Older Americans Act and work with the adult day centers and understand what the transportation challenges are. They oversee the dementia respite grant. So they're really on the ground kind of post-diagnosis, looking at what we need in our landscape and how we can make sure that older Vermonters and you know, this is state government, so particularly those people of the lower income levels are not falling through the cracks and are getting what they need. So that they're our partner on that side. And our other partner is with the Department of Health. And um, the two people we work most closely with there are Rhonda Williams and Ed DeMott, and you'll hear from Ed later. And um, they actually, we work with them because they went after the BOLD grant. You hear me talking about BOLD. BOLD is building our largest dementia infrastructure. It's a national program that gives money to states and municipalities to help them build out the infrastructure, the capacity for this growing number of people with dementia. So those are the two people that run our BOLD funding that we get in Vermont. It comes from the CDC. And they really focus on um, awareness, risk reduction, comorbidities, and then the infrastructure in terms of looking at the healthcare system. So helping to lead the groups that are looking at how are healthcare providers trained? What kinds of programs do we have for 
primary care providers or social workers or other people that that um, receive the training they need so that they can properly support people and move them through the system. So those are our two part, our two biggest partners. We work with a lot of other people because there's Medicaid and all kinds of other, this goes across all the different demographics and all the different um, silos of state government. But these are the two you'll hear me talking about is our Dale and the Department of Health. And then we have some organizational partners. Our, probably the biggest organizational partner we work with are the Area Agencies on Aging. There's five of those in the state of Vermont. That's like the first stop for anyone in Vermont who's over the age of 60 that needs anything. That's where you stop, and they should be your resource center. Again, particularly focusing on people who are of lower income levels. If you're really well-to-do and you get there, they're gonna say, yeah, there's all these programs, but you, we, you don't qualify for them. But that's wh who we work with. Um, and, and that's something we'll talk about too, is like what the qualifications are, because it is challenging. Um, but we work with the five area agencies on aging really closely. We have representatives from them here today. They have dementia care specialists there that are really working with families, um, particularly with dementia. And then they have um, their case managers and other people that are helping older Vermonters with all kinds of issues, issues that people with dementia have and everybody has. Like, how am I gonna keep my home? Or I'm food insecure, or I don't have transportation, or um, all, all of those pieces. And the area agencies on aging really are the conduit that then connect people out to other services like home health and hospice or the visiting nurses or um, senior meal programs, all of those kinds of things that happen in the community. So the area agencies on aging, and then one more slide. Um, the other two that we work most closely with are the adult day centers. Um, so there's 11 adult day programs in Vermont. There's a list on our program table in the back if you want to have those for your regions. And we work closely with them. And then the um, Dementia Family Caregiver Center at the University of Vermont Medical Center is, uh, is a strong partner of ours that we work with. And they're really focusing more on the caregiver side of this with programs that can help build support and capacity for caregivers, and one of the reasons we're really pushing for early diagnosis and awareness is because that gives you the time to build the capacity. That gives somebody the time to build the skills that they need to care for their loved one with dementia if they decide that they want to keep that person in their home or in their community. Um, and I think most importantly, and a lot of what we're talking about on the national and the state level is really the recognition of the impact of caregiving, particularly dementia caregiving, on the caregiver. So they aren't only talking to people about how to care for their loved one, they're talking to them about how to care for themselves. How to make sure that you don't end this experience and then you yourself are in a health, health crisis. Um, so we really enjoy working with them and they're here and will participate with us um, today as well. Alrighty, so I just wanted to do um, a quick little overview of what we've done so far. As I mentioned, this is the third year that we're holding an Alzheimer's Advocacy Day with me here. That's how long I've been with the organization. Um, in 2022, we had a small but mighty group of people that came here. We were working on a bill uh, that, that passed, so I'm happy to say that we are really successful. We did a lot of testimony in the State House that year. Um, several people that are here testified multiple times, and there had been a gap because of COVID. There had been a gap from lack of people in this position, and we really started to build some awareness through those stories of where are the major disconnects, and what came out really loudly that time was people just don't know where to go for anything. Um, so two of the things that, that happened that year that were really exciting was we put into statute that instead of having a state, uh, a plan on Alzheimer's and healthy aging and then a plan on aging in Vermont, starting with the next plan on aging, which is next year, they will be integrated together. That means everyone that's looking at what are we trying to meet, what are our metrics, where are we going, they only have to look in one place. They don't have to say, oh, this is where we're going for older Vermonters, and this is where we're going for older Vermonters with dementia. So streamlining that is, is a huge piece of starting to kind of bring all people together and have more of a level set. So that was really exciting. Um, and then we also had added to law the requirement for Dale and DOH to figure out how to create an easily accessible public education resource um, space. And it, it literally says in person, print, online, we're working at that. 
it's not easy because there's so much going on. There's so many partners. People change all the time. But we've made progress. We do have a spot online where there are a lot of materials now. And I think a big piece of the new state dementia coordinator's position is going to be to pick that up and figure out, are people using it? And if they're not using it, why aren't they using it? So we had a very exciting first year in the state house. And then you can go to the next one. Last year, we were back again, um, and we did a lot of testifying last year uh, when they had the public budget hearings. Fifteen people actually testified about the need for a state dementia coordinator and how having someone help to coordinate the services would be beneficial for them, and we were, we were successful in getting that position added to the budget, added to base funding, so we have a permanent state dementia services coordinator. That's Tiffany, who you're going to meet in a minute. She started in the middle of February. Um, so she's very new in her role, but that was a big win for us. And I think it really is, as she comes on board, going to be central in um, coordinating what we're doing and where we're going. And then this year, we have two priorities. We're halfway through the le legislative session, as the lieutenant governor said. We have two priorities. Um, one is to increase the dementia respite grant from $250,000 to $500,000. That's a grant that has not been increased since 2003. So um, I'm sure you can all think of something that costs something different in 2003 than it costs now. Um, we had people uh, testify again at the budget hearings for that. We worked very closely with the House Human Services Committee. They added it as a recommendation to be added to the appropriations. Um, unfortunately, none of the recommendations that they had for older Vermonters for the Dale budget were added to the appropriations budget as it's moving through the House right now. Um, this is terrible for us, but there's other pieces that are equally as bad, including not even cost of living increases for a lot of the direct care workers, and um, that's going to exacerbate the crisis we have of finding direct care workers. So. Um, this bill will now, well, the budget, the full budget, will now be moving to the Senate, and we have another shot to try and make our case for why $250,000 would have an actual impact on costs to the state, on wellness for caregivers, on wellness for people with dementia. Um, we believe about 100 more people could access the program. These are very small grants. They're not to pay caregivers. They're to give people respite or give them tools, so either use your funds as, as Betsy did to take a class on how to do caregiving, or to be able to pay for your loved one to go to an adult day for a certain period of time so you can take a break, or to go to a long-term care facility even for a week, for instance, if you need to go to a funeral or a graduation or a wedding. Um, so we are advocating for that. When we take our break, there's a take action table in the back, and you can add your name to the letter that says that you want this to continue. So. We're asking the Senate Health and Welfare Committee and the Senate Appropriations Committee to please consider adding this, to please add this to the fiscal year 25 budget. Um, and the second bill that we're working on is the numbers S302. As the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, it has fully passed the Senate and it's incorporating dementia risk into public health outreach campaigns. So this would educate providers on the importance of early diagnosis, on the importance of caregivers, on the importance of the uh, annual Medicare visit as a way to start cognitive screening. It would also ed educate the public on risk factors, um, the importance of early diagnosis, why, for instance, reducing your hypertension is good for your brain or being active is good for your brain. So we testified, some folks in the room here testified, we testified in the Senate Health and Welfare Committee and it passed that committee. It passed the full Senate and it's now in the House. Human Services Committee, and so there's also a letter over there asking the House Human Services Committee to please take this bill up and move it through their committee um, so it can pass this year. I do believe it's going to pass. The good thing is there's not an appropriation with that bill. Um, it's also not a magic bullet. It doesn't do everything. It puts into practice that this is what should be done and lays the groundwork for us then and for our partners to go forward and integrate um, education a little bit more a little bit more deeply into the work that's being done. So um, that's what's happening on the Alzheimer's front in Montpelier and some of what we're gonna be working on today. And now I am um, really excited to introduce T Tiffany Smith, the new State Dementia Services Coordinator. And I'm gonna pull up her slide deck and she's gonna talk to you a little bit about um, what she's doing and what she's planning on doing in her role. So come on up.
okay if I tilt this to the side a little bit so I can look and speak? I don't wanna. Thank you. Is that you? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I know I didn't wanna move too much. I know you had it set up perfect. All right, uh, thank you everyone. Um, thank you Alzheimer's Association for inviting me to speak. And um, also thank you to our advocates and uh, legislators for approving this position. Um, thank you for the, to the Alzheimer's, um, the Governor's Commission on Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias for making this their legislative priority for actually several, several years. So I, I really appreciate it and I'm honored to be here and be uh, the first person in this role. Um, so, uh, coming into this role about two months ago, um, I thought it would be important to sort of visualize what is a dementia service system. We certainly know that there are uh, programs available in the state through our Old Americans Act, um, as Meg, Meg had mentioned, but what does this look like when we think about how to um, improve and, and coordinate a system? And so, um, we know that there are uh, multiple efforts to take place on different levels across the straight state, looking at societal level, improving culture and stigma, uh, awareness and attitude towards dementia, uh, living, people living with dementia, and the challenges of their caregivers. Meg had mentioned those legislative uh, goals and also successes, so what happens at our policy level um, is also another part of this system, uh, the federal, state, and local policy regulations, what happens in legislation. Um, I think what most of us are familiar with is what's happening at a community level. So what are those systems of, uh, for delivery of services and supports? What's happening in home and community-based organizations? Um, what's available for those who are living independently? And also what happens when someone needs to um, transition into higher levels of care and what's available? Um, and then certainly at the individual and family level is a very important part of this system. Um, you know, how do we best uh, meet the needs and prioritize individuals who are living with dementia and their caregivers um, and creating these social networks um, and making sure that, uh, that there's opportunities for skill building, counseling, education, um, and also looking at our workforce and what sort of training and supports are needed uh, for, those, for those individuals. Next slide. So the primary goal uh, that I identified for this position would to be develop an accessible and coordinated statewide system. Um, ultimately, you know, we want to improve and pr provide the supports uh, to people living with dementia across care settings uh, and in community. We want to build partnerships that leverage public and private resources. Meg had mentioned that there's a, a lot of cogs in the wheel of ways to receive services, um, whether it's state or federally funded, and then certainly other organizations um, with separate funding streams. Uh, and certainly looking for innovations that will ensure continued effective outcomes into the future. Um, so looking at evidence-based programs and uh, creative models, whether it's intergenerational care, um, care models uh, for respite, or um, faith-based community respite. Next slide. So I've identified a few data-driven areas of focus. So over the last few years, we've been really fortunate through our partners at Department of Health, Alzheimer's Association, and other state agencies to be collecting a lot of data on the experiences of individuals living with Alzheimer's and their care partners. So it's really important that, I th that through this work, we look at ways to create easy access points to service and supports. Uh, implement effective methods for assessment and service planning for people living with dementia and their family caregivers. Excuse me. To improve the delivery of information, education, training supports, referral, and care coordination. I'd like to promote greater adoption of person and family centered care across all care settings, and making sure that the person and the caregiver are at the center of planning and decision making. Enhance and expand innovative res respite options. We certainly know that workforce is an issue, but there are some other models nationally that have proven to be successful. Um, and also improving programming for health promotion and disease prevention, evidence-based offerings for individuals living independently with dementia and also for their caregivers. Next slide. And so how does this work? Well, it's through partnership. Um, here I've identified uh, some leads, uh, organizations across the state um, who are directly uh, involved in more of the um, direct service uh, for individuals living with Alzheimer's. 
Meg mentioned many of these, and certainly you'll notice that there's uh, regional uh, leads as far as UVM, Gifford Hospital Neurology Program, uh, Memory Clinic in Bennington, and even 211 is sort of a statewide resource. Uh, but through this work, I would like to also identify more partners and see who else we can get involved in sort of this larger system coordination. Next slide. So together, in this collaborative effort to improve the service uh, network and better serve individuals living with dementia and their caregivers, I really hope that we will build a care, care and service system that will provide individuals with an opportunity to be fully informed of their health status and care needs, uh, to access support options that give caregivers the relief that they need, and to make the caregiving tasks more manageable. Uh, ca effective case management uh, for individuals living with dementia uh, and the ability to make decisions about care transitions and coordination with confidence for their caregivers and overall an improved quality of life. I'd like to invite you all to reach out to me um, and uh, let me know uh, if you'd like to be a partner or where we think that this work could cross over into your organization and really help improve and coordinate our system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. We're excited to work with you. And just so everybody knows, Tiffany and I will be facilitating the next session after the break about like how we do this. So there'll be a lot of times to hear your ideas and to, to build those connections. So that is happening. So now I'm going to invite Ed DeMont up and he's going to talk about, so you remember he was on the Vermont Department of Health side now. He's going to talk about the BOLD program and the infrastructure that we have been building and are building um, to look at the work from that side. So come on up, Ed, and I will pull your slide deck up. Good morning, everybody. Okay, so as Meg said, I'm here today to, of course, lend my support to Alzheimer's advocacy, but also to cover a little bit about what the Department of Health is doing in the Alzheimer's Disease and Healthy Aging Program, which is uh, a grand total of two staff, so um, not the largest uh, division in the uh, Department of Health. I thought I'd start, though, because we are here for ad advocacy, to start with a, a little story, because I feel like stories are much more impactful than numeric data, no matter how compelling that numeric data may seem on paper. So I won't take too long on the story, I promise. It's not part of the slideshow. <laughs> so my dad and his sister have both passed away um, from Alzheimer's disease. Um, his sister was diagnosed at 59, with early onset, passed away at 67. And my dad was diagnosed much later, the more typical um, scenario, and uh, gave up driving on his own, which is a very rare occurrence, which was lovely. Um, so there were no battles about that. Uh, this was all during COVID. And uh, he was at an adult daycare. And of course, the adult daycare closed because of the pandemic, and you can imagine the decline afterward. Um, social, you know, social engagement was essentially nil. I mean, I was with him all the time. My partner was with him, but of course, we were all isolating. Um, he sadly passed away in toward the beginning of when the world was opening up again, uh, after seven weeks in long-term care, um, at a time when I was not able to visit him. So, I. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, sure, sure. I'm too tall. Maybe I should. <laughs> I need to shrink. I can sit on the stage. <laughs> okay, that's great. Is this better? Okay, great. I'm sorry. So, yeah, I just wanted to make the connection that, um, what's that? I said it was a great story for those who didn't. Basically, I just wanted to tell the story so that you know that, that this is the reason I'm in this role. I switched jobs at the Department of Health when my dad passed because I felt I needed to do this work. So, um, so I feel you. Um, so I'm going to start with um, a little bit of a look at BOLD. <laughs> and we throw that 
acronym around all the time. Meg defined it for you, building our largest dementia infrastructure. They left out the I, not sure why. Boldy, I guess, was not as a compelling a title. Um, so basically, the Bold Infrastructure for Alzheimer's Act passed Congress in very late 2018. In fact, I think on New Year's Eve, so truly very late. And uh, that actually granted money, among other things, to um, the CDC to begin to fund states to develop their infrastructure to respond to this growing public health crisis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, the bold activities are designed to create a uniform national public health infrastructure. Now, we say that some states are, have a very well-developed infrastructure. Some are just beginning to develop their infrastructure. So of the 50 states, there's, there's a continuum of where, where they're at. Um, those are the four pillars of bold. I like to call them pillars or focus areas. So that's where our um, attention is focused as we work through the bold grant. Um, the initial grant, which happened in 2020, when the Vermont Department of Health was in tier one response to COVID. So you can imagine that first year, not a lot of things got done on the bold grant. I didn't get hired until 2021. Um, the focus of that grant was to increase coordination in the state and collaboration, establish a state dementia coalition, create a state plan to respond to dementia from a public health perspective. And we did that. We were very successful. We got our action plan published in uh, September, October of 2022. After our first year, we had 114 activities listed in that plan. We had achieved and or started 64 of them after the first year. And I also just want to point out that sometimes public health focusing on populations that trickle down isn't always felt by the individual who's experiencing you know, being a caregiver or a, a diagnosis. But trust me, the work is happening. And um, that action plan is something we're all very proud of. Meg was instrumental. And I want to say, as I continue, that, as Meg said, our two very principal partners are Dale, particularly the Unit on Aging, and the Alzheimer's Association. But there are so many others. I'm not going to list them. Um, hey, Rachel. <laughs> I'm not going to list them. but. Um, we appreciate all that work. And as we go through the slideshow, I will identify other partners as well. And if I leave anybody out, please know that there's a multitude of folks working on this. Can I have the next slide? Great. OK. So one of the um, work groups that we have um, is called the Hub and Spoke Work Group, which is composed of folks from aging services, health systems, physicians, um, advanced practice nurses and other partners as well. The other partners is also very broad, right? So this group develops educational resources for primary care providers particularly, and the, the end game of the work is to kind of take the pressure off the memory programs you know, at UVM, at Dartmouth, and in Bennington, so that primary care has more of a capacity to detect, diagnose, and help manage dementias in the primary care setting which is also helpful in Vermont because we're a very rural state, and sometimes it takes a really long time for people to get from the town that they live in to the, to the specialty care. And some examples of the educational initiatives that happened um, as a w result of the work of the Hub and Spoke are Project Echoes, which is an evidence-based program out of the University of New Mexico. And we devised one here in Vermont with uh, the Un University of Vermont School of Nursing and uh, AHEC, which is the administrator of the um, particular um, Project ECHO. And this educates primary care providers on a multitude of topics about dementia. Uh, they review case studies. It's all virtual. We've been fortunate that approximately 250 members of primary care teams so far since the first Project ECHO launched in uh, 2021, 250 primary care team members have taken the course and completed it. So um, that expansion of the capacity of primary care is happening, slowly, but happening. Another really exciting uh, development is the establishment of the Vermont Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Project, which just began accepting patients, um, I think, a month or so ago. And it's based on the UCLA Dementia Care model. And it can take 200 dementia patients in Vermont and help to connect them to services. They have a uh, 
I forget what it's called. An Alzheimer's assistant? I'm forgetting the title. Doesn't matter. A person who liaises with the folks who are in the program, connects them to services, makes sure they're, um, they're doing what they need to do to allay and hopefully um, help treat their disease. So um, that is just, in a nutshell, a little bit about what happens in the hub and spoke uh, realm. Next slide, please. So this next slide is a little bit of an exception because a lot of this work happens internally at VDH because VDH has a lot of um, programs around chronic disease that are funded by the uh, CDC, the Center for Disease Control. So um, we meet often with our other CDC-funded programs. Integration is incredibly important. Um, and one in four Vermonters are 60 years and older, and by 2030, that ratio is expected to increase to one in three. And we know that aging increases our risk for many chronic diseases, um, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, cancer, and of course, Alzheimer's disease. So working to prevent chronic disease across the lifespan is an important component of this work, and particularly in midlife, um, where a lot of the literature shows that um, control, effective control of chronic diseases in midlife and or prevention is, uh, is the best way to allay the development of dementia. Just wanted to review a little bit about primary prevention and secondary prevention, because we throw those terms around too. Primary prevention basically aims at preventing the disease condition from ever happening. So it's educating people so that they can maybe make some lifestyle changes, um, eat healthier, move more, and prevent the development of disease. Secondary prevention aims to reduce the impact of the disease once it's been diagnosed. So stay healthier even though you have this diagnosis. And how do you do that? By controlling your blood sugar, taking your blood pressure medications, whatever the scenario is. So our program has created multiple media campaigns, mostly social media, um, with the cardiovascular disease um, folks and with the diabetes folks, and we've gotten a lot of this messaging out there. Ferrying people to My Healthy Vermont, which is a website that contains evidence-based programs where people can log in, join up for free, um, teaches them how to manage their diabetes better um, in a group setting, a virtual group setting, I think, mostly now. But, um, but nonetheless, there's that um, support of others going through the same type of situation. Okay. We're good, next slide. Thank you. Okay, so another way that bold, bold funds have been helpful to Vermont is to enable us to bolster our data collection because one of the things that I think nationally but certainly on a state-by-state -state basis, some states have been very, very fortunate to collect a lot of data. Vermont is, we're making our way there. And uh, one of the data products that we produce, which I'm particularly proud of, is our caregiver, caregiving in Vermont, a caregiver profile data brief, basically. So last summer, we interviewed four folks who were willing to share their stories as caregivers with us. And um, we paired those stories with data from the BRFSS and another thing we throw around a lot, the Behavior Risk Factors Surveillance System. It's an annual telephone survey of adult Vermonters. Um, happens every year, and it basically tracks health-related risk behaviors, chronic health conditions, and use of supportive services. And that's a lot of our data comes from that. There are two um, modules that can be incorporated into the BRFSS, and this is where the bold funding comes in. If we're lucky and there's space on the survey, we will pay for a caregiving module, which will ask people questions about their experiences caregiving, and then there's also a module on subjective cognitive decline which basically asks people, do they feel that they are having cognitive issues? It's a self-perception kind of measure, but it's important and it's often an indicator of development of mild cognitive impairment later and ultimately perhaps dementia. So this data brief, though, has very compelling stories of caregivers, lots of struggle. Um, you'll see it if you, if you decide to read it and you can log onto our website and access it there. Um, but also some joys and a lot of attention being brought to bear on what we actually need to do for caregivers. And so it's a, it's a vital, I think, a vital resource and it's something that hadn't existed before. So please take a look if you're surfing the net one day. Next slide. 
Okay, and the last body of work we'll look at today, just to, to wrap up, is dementia-friendly Vermont. And we know that a vast majority of older Vermonters, like 91 percent, yeah, 91 percent, want to stay in their homes um, and in the communities that they love. We also know that over 20 percent of Vermont adults are 65 and older, and the number is rising, as we saw before. So since age is the principal risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and dementia development, moving toward a dementia-friendly communities model is, seems a particularly strong public health imperative. As a state, we have yet to commit to being dementia-friendly, but individual communities can opt in. And our offices of local health, you may know that there are district offices, there are 12 district offices of the Department of Health located across the state. And we have staff in those offices that have very, very close relationships with municipal governments, uh, with work sites, because they do work site wellness programs, um, and also with other community-based organizations. So since uh, Dementia Friendly Vermont rolls out in a very sector-specific way, um, those folks in the local health offices are at the ready to begin to roll this out in other towns if towns are showing interest. So they'll be doing a little bit of a dog and pony show soon um, to kind of get the word out locally and hopefully more towns will take advantage. Currently Middlebury, I believe, is the only town that has opted in and they're making some great progress. And that picture on the lower right there is basically, if you look on our website, it's actually an interactive map, we'll say. And if you click on the cloud, as I said, Dementia-friendly Vermont is a sector-specific way of approaching being a dementia-friendly community. So you can click on the banking and financial cloud and it'll say, okay, if you're a bank or a financial institution, here's how you can be more dementia-friendly. If you're a library, here's how you can. So I encourage you to look at that as well. And there's also a Dementia-Friendly America website, which has amazing resources. Um, ours is kind of the tip of the iceberg and that was produced um, in partnership with lots of folks again, but I just want to call out particularly uh, Tiffany from Dale and also uh, the University of Vermont Center on Aging. Okay, all right. And with that, next slide, there we go. Please contact me anytime. There's a lot more going on than what we talked about in the last 12 or 15 minutes. And if you want clarification on anything, always happy and always happy to just chat as well. Um, yeah. Okay, great, thanks for your time. So you all can see now that I get to work with some amazing people here in the state of Vermont, and there are a lot of us doing this work. It is a heavy lift, but together we are really making progress, and we're gonna talk more about that after. So now it's break time. We have about 10 to 12 minutes for break. Um, the bathrooms again, food. I do wanna point out that at the chapter table in the back, we have a resource guide that an intern helped us put together last year. It's a, uh, a pretty extensive booklet that has high level resources for someone who thinks that they're experiencing cognitive decline or has had a diagnosis and has in it all, it's meant to be a printed resource. We do have it online, but it's meant to be a one piece that someone could take that would connect them to Dale, to the area agencies on aging, to Alzheimer's, to some of the information around brain health, et cetera. Um, so please stop by the, our chapter table and grab that and talk with the staff if you want. And then also I mentioned the take action le letters. Those are at the table with Jasmine and Maddie back here. And I would love for people to sign those letters. There's instructions back there, but you write your name, print your name and you can write a compelling fact or two if you want. I will be delivering those letters to the chairs of those committees tomorrow probably, um, but I just thought as a different way for them to visualize us being here since we aren't able to be in all the committees that that would be um, an important thing to do. And then we'll come back after the break and that will be um, hearing from advocates and the group brainstorm on sort of what we wanna do and then I'll explain how we're gonna spend the second part of the day um, in the State House. So take a break, try and meet somebody new if you can and we will be back in about 10 or 15 minutes thank you alrighty everybody so we're gonna transition um, and I really I have to say I loved how y'all broke and mingled like it reminded me that we do have something in common here and we are a family and it's a safe space and I loved that because I've been in so many groups where you make you break and everybody does their own little thing so that was beautiful to see and we will have another bigger break um, 
actually two more breaks today for that to continue and for people to continue to sign the take action um, cards. But we're going to switch now. I wanted to give an opportunity for some of the advocates, and I know like basically every person in this room is an advocate and has been out advocating and, and doing activities, and we'll bring those up in the shares. Um, but I did want to give an opportunity for three advocates that we've been working with this year to share a little bit about the different things that they do, and I really picked them because they're gonna talk about three very different things, to start to paint the picture of how huge the range of options we have is when we're talking about getting involved, trying to advance policy, trying to destigmatize this disease, trying to build infrastructure. Um, so we are going to start with Daryl Rudy from St. Johnsbury, and he's gonna take a couple minutes to share some of the things he's participated in this year. No, that's good. Am I okay here? Can you hear me? So I like to introduce myself as Daryl Rudy, just an old Ukrainian trying to make it through today. And uh, I have Alzheimer's. I was diagnosed four years ago. And the things that I want to talk about are destigmatizing is the first thing. And I'm not a shy guy. I come from a theater background. And uh, I, I love to talk, so she's going to have to get the hook to get me off of here. And it's really, <laughs> it's really important. I'm not shy about sharing anything. I have an amazing partner back there, Barbara. And uh, <laughs> we just share it and, and talk to people whenever we can. So it's very important to destigmatize. The second thing is, raising awareness. I think as uh, the previous gentleman spoke, you know, I happen to be 80 years old, and in a few years, there's going to be the aging population of people 60 and over, and that's going to increase more and more the dementia and Alzheimer's that we're working with in this country. So we need to be aware of that, and the best thing I can say while I'm up here and I give uh, all the credit to Barbara. There's this thing we call denial, and denial is not a river in Egypt. <laughs> denial is when you don't admit something might be there, and you should find out about it. I wasn't that aware, and Barbara said, come on, we're gonna go see, get the test. She wrote me in, drove me over, and uh, she, <laughs> she's back. <laughs> and sure enough, it came out a positive. And I would not have really recognized it. So, and why am I saying this? Early intervention is so, so important. And uh, thanks to Barbara, uh, it worked for us and for me. And um, connect to resources. Connect to resources, connect to resources. Barbara and I have, I mean, she's got a laundry list of resources. I've been fortunate enough to really go through numerous resources that help Barbara and me. So that's another very key, key ingredient. And again, you know, if, if there's ever anybody that wants to be an advocate for Alzheimer's, I'm one. And everybody in this room obviously is as well. So we, Miss Barb and I, just really are about advocacy and going out. We've been to Washington, D.C. We've been to Boston. We've been to I don't know how many places. Uh, we just did an Alzheimer's uh, talk at uh, a local food uh, place where people who don't eat a lot are able to get food in Lindenville. And uh, so I wanted to share that. And uh, by the wonderful creativity and future seeing, we're part of a video that came out through the Alzheimer's Association. And the two people we worked with 
making that video who were the people who did the shooting and we become close friends with them that's how wonderful it's been so if there's an opportunity or you we can talk with you to, to get this video and look at it or or pass it around that would be a wonderful gift for the Alzheimer's Association, a gift for people who have Alzheimer's, and a gift for the people who are seeing it. So highly, 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 I would recommend that. And uh, what else do I have to say here? Uh, oh, yeah, and we already did the one in Lindenville, Barbara and I, with, with a group of people. So that's my story, and, and I got to say partly Bar Barbara's story as well. And what a lucky man I am. Thank you. So Daryl mentioned the video, and Ed put some important links around dementia-friendly communities. I just want you all to know that I will send an email to everyone that registered um, to your email address that will have the links to all of these things you're hearing about so you can dive a little further into them. And there were three videos that we produced. They're on our YouTube page. Daryl's is called Embracing Alzheimer's. So he is very bold. And um, this afternoon, we will all be on the House floor where Michael will be giving the devotional. Um, but Daryl will be on the Senate floor um, sharing a Buddhist prayer as part of the Senate devotional and part of Advocacy Day today. So we won't be seeing that because we'll be in the opposite chamber. But I did want to mention to you that that's how vocal and how brave and how open he is about the disease and about the fact that it's just a disease and he's still who he is. So thank you so much, Daryl and Barb, for all that you're doing for us. Yeah. And next I'm going to invite Betsy from Rutland up to share a little bit about what she's been doing. Perfect. Can you hear me? Is that good? Okay. So thank you all for being here. Um, part of the, uh, unlike Daryl, part of the uh, being an advocate for me that is the hardest is standing up in front of people. It is not my comfort zone. It has never been my comfort zone, but it always was my mom's comfort zone. And she's been advocating for things all of her life. So when she got Alzheimer's, of course, that's what she wanted to do. So I learned how to go and talk to uh, people in Washington, DC, talk to people in Montpelier, talk to our neighbors, talk to her friends. And she, I've been very, very blessed that she has been so open to tell anybody and anybody that will listen to her that she has Alzheimer's. Um, so. What I'm trying to say is you can go the big, the big um, route and uh, the Alzheimer's Association is amazingly helpful and will get you through, even somebody like me that doesn't like to do public speaking, they will help you and it, it really is very empowering. But you can also do a lot of little things. I wear the Alzheimer's bracelet every single day and it's amazing how many people, how many conversations I've had with people in a coffee shop. Um, I wear the Walk to End Alzheimer's t-shirt when I'm working out. How many people have come up to me and said just something? You know, I, I hear a lot about different people's um, experiences that way, and it's a way to share. So my encouraging to my encouragement to all of you is to find new ways, and how do you keep talking about it, and how do you keep people um, realizing that it's not something that you can catch. We had one of the people that was living with my mom that wouldn't sit next to her because she was afraid that she was going to catch Alzheimer's. That's not cool. Like, we, we have a right for everybody to, to um, help people understand that this is a, a tough disease to have, it is a chronic disease, um, and together we can find an end to it. And I encourage you to look at all the different little things that you can do as well. Thank you so much, Betsy and Jenny, for all that you do. Um, and I'm going to invite John from Hartford. 
uh, up to talk to us a little bit about the activities he's been participating in this year. So yeah, um, John Bouton, I am from Hartford, White River Junction. Um, there's an adjacent town, Heartland, which is why we kind of get confused. Who knows which one is which? Anyway, um, good morning. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, how I became engaged. Um, my wife, sort of towards the beginning of the pandemic, and actually before the beginning of the pandemic, had felt there was something wrong. Um, that was also sort of coinciding with the time that we were both retiring. Um, I'm 73 now, so we're, you know, looking back five or so years, five, six, seven years. Um, and quite frankly, that, that for us, that was a tough time. You know, we had both had our own careers, doing our own thing, and then to try to remesh our relationship or relesh a deeper relationship and figure out what we wanted to do with the next 35 years was challenging. Um, on top of that, um, Judy had behaviors that was just sort of irritating me, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> one of the things that that happened is she was a quilter. She was an amazing artist, an amazing quilter, a great teacher of uh, reading in elementary schools, um, promoter of the arts. Um, and w w so one of the things that happened was that every time she would go somewhere to do a quilting class or something, even though she had this long, big wall full of cubby holes, full of fabric, she would always come back with more. Um, she had a very, very nice sewing machine. I mean, a really nice one. Um, and she came back from another event with another one because it was like $200 off or something like that. I don't know. But it was behaviors like that that, that were sort of kind of normal for her, but just a little bit further on the outside. Um, Yeah, no, it's, it, it was just, so, so those sorts of things I just didn't pick up on, really. I mean, I, our, our relationship was quite frankly, it was sort of spiraling downhill um, because of this, and I didn't really realize what was going on. One of the things that happened was that she was interested in, in uh, she, she felt that something was wrong and had gotten a referral from a PCP, and um, we always took care of our own health needs. Um, and I was pretty surprised and quite frankly pissed off when the time came for her to for her zoom meeting and she was always very prompt and she didn't attend it you know and I figured out later she didn't know how to run the zoom she'd forgotten how to do that even though she'd been very capable before had another referral that I went to and that for me was a, a game changer sort of a moment um, as, as she was sort of going through those various tests, the three words and all of those sorts of things, it became really apparent that something was really wrong. And so instantly my attitude went from one of, oh, Judy, you're just trying to piss me off. I don't like this. This is not fun, to, oh, you can't help it. We're, we're on a different path now. Um, that was critical. Um, and that was one of the stories that I told at one of the times that I was asked, that Meg asked if I'd be willing to um, testify behind, um, before one of the Senate committees. And it was about um, the issue of early detection. Um, if Judy had been detected earlier, we could have done more. Um, we, would have, we could have adjusted more. We could have had a better relationship earlier on. So really, really pretty critical. Um, some of the other things that, um, See, now I, I've got to admit, I'm, I kind of under and over prepare. I've got like six pages of text written here. I gotta get the hook out. You don't get six pages. I know I don't get six pages. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, okay. Um, so uh, I, I guess I also wanna say, I wanna, I wanna give a, a kind of a shout out to Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, we live in White River Junction, so Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center is like seven miles away from us. Um, as we're in Vermont, I think we oftentimes think of UVM and the medical center there as being a key piece. Well, it is. 
and there's something in Bennington as well. But we have over on the east coast of Vermont um, another facility that's out of state but was a tremendous resource for us. They have an aging resource center. I had weekly or biweekly um, Zoom support groups going on that I was part of that was really essential in me figuring out with other people and the facilitator how to deal with different changes and what to expect as things were going along. Um, really important. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I think it's, it's also very important for us to have the statewide coordinator so we can pull these pieces together. I know that we had like, there were six or seven different opportunities of resources and trying to sort them out was sort of a challenge. Um, we had that main one and that was, that was good for us. Um, another thing that I want to say is that um, from my experience, I rely on Judy's experiences. Um, I bring her with me. Um, she died last September. Um, this is one of her many very colorful scarves. Um, but now that she's gone, um, I really feel a commitment, have always felt a commitment to do public service, but now really feel a commitment to make some of the good things out of the bad that happened. So sharing my experiences, um, sharing sort of personal details that I would never really reveal in a, in a in, in kind of casual conversation. But if there's a point to be made, that's more important than, um, um, than, than, than kind of pointing out that I was kind of a jerk for not recognizing that Judy was having troubles. Um, I will be going down to Washington, D.C. in another week and a half. Um, my grandson, who is turning 17, will be going down with me, um, and we'll be doing some work down there. Um, we're going to miss the eclipse, um, but um, um, this should be a great experience, great learning experience for me as, as well as for him. So thank you. Thank you, John and Betsy and Daryl, for shining a light on Alzheimer's. So hopefully, first of all, thank you to Alicia for the idea. I know she's sitting back there, but you all should have received a box that has a little light with our 800 number, which we are always happy to take calls at if you are in trouble, if your family or friend are in trouble, or if you just have a question. Um, if I know there's more people than seats here. If you did not get one of these, we have a box with extra ones up here, and we would love to have you take one of these home because all of you are shining lights on this disease and on the need to kind of come out of the darkness and really address Alzheimer's and all other dementias in our state. So thank you. Thank you for the, the work that all of you are doing and the work that all of you are doing. And I'm now going to invite Tiffany up. And we're going to facilitate the brainstorm around what we need and what we can offer. And um, as these folks are moving out, please don't trip. I will just set it up a little bit to say we're going to start. Um, Tiffany's going to facilitate the first part. And we're going to start. The idea is to look at the role of advocates, the way that we, people on the ground, people in this room and out of this room, um, can help destigmatize dementia, build infrastructure, and advance policy. And part of that starts with knowing what is needed. So if you're an organization here, I encourage you to think of what do you need? Do you need volunteers? Do you need funding? Do you need a place to hold your meeting? Do you need drivers? If you're a person living with the disease or caring for someone or living with someone with the disease, I encourage you to think about what do we need in order to live a full life here in Vermont. And I'll be taking notes. We're going to do that for about 15 minutes. I know we could do this for like the entire day, but we're going to do it for about 15 minutes. And then we're going to switch to what we can offer. Like how can we as organizations and groups start to do that networking to meet those needs? So. Um, Tiffany, you're going to drive here. Oh, and Rebecca's going to be in the middle here with the mic. So if you want to speak, please raise your hand. She'll bring the mic to you so it gets caught on the, on the um, video that we're making. By the way, thank you to Orca Media for videoing this event. This will be available on your local public access station. You can work with me to figure out how to get it requested. Um, but this is also a huge way to share what we're doing. So raise your hand if you want to speak. Please say your name and where you're from when you speak so we can start to network a little bit that way. And try to make your points as short as possible so we can get as many ideas in as short a period of time as possible. Thank you. 
All right, is there anyone who has something that immediately comes to mind when you're thinking of what you as an individual or your organization needs um, in community, uh, whether it's for the people that you serve or an experience that you've had as somebody living with dementia or a caregiver? Who would like to start? Hi, I'm Pamela Smith. I have dementia, and I'm the primary caregiver to my mother who has more advanced dementia. Um, what we really need is like a family case manager or social worker, and it's the same person every time, and it doesn't just happen because some emergency has shown up. I think for us, the biggest challenges are our uh, executive function starts going early, and that makes doing all kinds of things really hard, and I think it would cut down on a lot of freakouts. Um, I think it makes people feel more comfortable with, with mom living at home. So anyway, a single contact that helps our family with whatever stuff shows up, um, and mostly it will be around tasks that, that require executive function. Hi. Oh my goodness. I am so sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, it's still working. Okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, now that everybody's awake. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sherry, and uh, my husband has late-stage Alzheimer's. Um, he was diagnosed 10 years ago. Uh, he's done extremely well up until the last year. Um, a year ago, you wouldn't have known he had Alzheimer's, which was pretty amazing. We caught it in the early stage, and there's certain medicines out there that they give um, to kind of delay the process, which has been wonderful. Uh, so he's been very, very functional, and a lot of our friends have had uh, difficulty understanding that he, ha he really does have Alzheimer's. Um, what I have found as the main caregiver, and really the only uh, caregiver, we have a daughter and a son. My daughter's in North Carolina, and our son is here with a very busy business. Um, so it really is me. And what I'm finding is uh, I consider myself a fairly intelligent person, but I am not only overwhelmed with my husband's issues, but I also am overwhelmed with resources and the amount of paperwork and, and that there's not, as you said, one direct person that can guide me through this process. It is just overwhelming. And I go to bed at night and, um, you know, I lie awake just trying to sort things out in my head. And uh, I've always been very good at this, and I just, I don't know where to turn. I have a wonderful gal at Aging Well. And uh, Emily is amazing, but she's only mine for maybe a day a week or, or a couple of hours a week. So I agree completely with what you're saying. And I don't have Alzheimer's yet, but <laughs> I've been feeling like I'm not in control anymore. So that's where I'm at. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I will just say John will be able to share more about this. We meet as advocates usually on the first Friday of the month virtually. We'll be meeting in May when we come back from D.C. And there's a new bill that's just been introduced in the House in Washington called the ADAPT. Creating navigation systems and training providers to help with that care navigator and the importance of single care navigators. How we get there is a big question, but this is definitely a topic that is, you are not alone. This is the number one thing that we're still talking about is the, the case manager, the care navigator, and that's one of the things that's being really tested out in the system that Ed talked about with the UCLA model um, that's taking place up at the UVM. Uh, memory center right now is really testing out like what kind of navigation is needed what do they need to know what, what do we need to connect them to do we have what we need to connect them to so thank you for sharing that go ahead i'm greg lothrop i have vascular dementia um 
I've had it for over 10 years, and I try to get people to understand that, and it's a great T-shirt over here. I'm still me, even though I have problems. We do have a support group that we belong with and have started uh, in Harmony, and what I was looking for is for us to find spaces to hold our meetings. That, that's that been our problem, to find a place that is willing to let us have a monthly meeting and so that we can get more people involved in working together to try to understand how to deal with this uh, disease. Hi, my name is uh, Aaron Clark, and I'm working on a project for intergenerational care in central Vermont. Um, but what I had to say kind of spoke to what Ed had touched on um, about training primary care, and when I hear about you know potential programs for um, for you know kind of bringing funds and relying on resources. A lot of times it seems to come back to the primary care providers, like, oh, well, here's a way for us to get this, these resources out. We'll go to primary care. Uh, and although I don't work in primary care, I work in home health, primary care is so overwhelmed right now. Um, I mean, home health is overwhelmed. But getting anything out of primary care, even a call back um, on patients, is incredibly difficult. So when I hear about, you know, like, oh, we could do this and deliver it through primary care, I think that has to be thought of along with how do we expand the capacity of primary care because as it exists right now, it can do, it barely does what it needs to do, much less anything more. Hi, I just wanted to piggyback off of that thought and maybe add um, ways to, sorry, what'd you say, Meg? Oh, I'm Rachel. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Wiley. Um, I currently live in South Burlington, very new to Vermont, so um, looking forward to learning more about the community from all of you, um, but also thinking about, you know, if there are potential funding sources to incorporate other healthcare professionals in primary care. So I'm an occupational therapist. There's a lot of talk in the occupational therapy world about integrating OT in primary care offices to try to support them um, with you know, some of these cases like individuals living with dementia. So if we could find funding sources to support that, that could be an avenue to explore. Good morning. Um, I'm Carol Lothrop, the external brain to this man right here for 53 years. Um, I'm. We have a support group in Harmony, which uh, different members of our group are at different stages. But recently, we've had several that are going to uh, memory care centers. And I guess the advocacy that I am about right now is the cost of this. And Sherry, right here to my left, dear friend of mine, her husband is in the Mansfield House in Essex. Maple, at, Maple Ridge. Maple Ridge, excuse me, at $14,000 a month. Um, our, one of our other dear members of our support group is out to uh, Birchwood at $13,000 a month. And I just think this is an, it's just unconscionable. I just cannot imagine anybody in the state of Vermont, unless you are a millionaire, and unless you have the resources, and unless you have long care insurance, that any average person has to sell their home, you know, dumb down everything they have to get Medicaid, to get into a place that is Medicaid, Medicare approved, this just does not seem real, and it is happening in the state of Vermont. There's just so few places that will take Medicare or Medicaid. Everything else is um, insurance paid or private paid, whatever that you have to be able to pay for those that amount of money. I just think we need to truly address that. I want to add to Carol. Thank you. This does 
disease drives us into poverty. It yeah. most certainly does. Thank you, Carol, because I wanted to bring that up at some point today as well. But I do want to add to that is that um, uh, it, the cost is just astronomical, and there's no resolution. It's um, um, the, the places that are not expensive, and when I say not expensive, I'm talking maybe $6,000 a month, um, are not a place that you necessarily want to place your loved one. Um, I understand that they're understaffed and there's not enough people that have been um, trained uh, to manage to run a facility like this. Uh, when my husband went to Maple Ridge, and this has been about six weeks now, um, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, however, um, the food um, is uh, basically something that your middle school kids probably getting at uh, school. It's awful. Um, I've sat in on several meals. Um, there are organized activities, but yet there aren't. Um, my husband is a wanderer, so he had to be in a lockdown facility. Um, and I've basically been told when my money runs out, I said, well, what do I do? And she said, well, you're out the door. And um, so, you know, <laughs> um, there's a movie, I think. I've told Carol about this movie. <laughs> um, it's called The Leisure Seekers with um, Helen Mirren and uh, Donald Sutherland. And I think it's worth watching to see what people like myself have to contemplate. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Joanne Ehrenhaus, and I'm here with a crew from Senior Solutions Area Agency on Aging for Southeastern Vermont. Happy to be here. I'm learning a lot from everybody. It's echoing a lot of our concerns. Uh, from my perspective right now, my role is as the uh, manager of all of our volunteer programs. And due to a lot of the issues that you all are expressing, I'm finding that the load of helping to take care of people with dementia more and more and more is falling onto volunteers who are ill-prepared to go into people's homes and take over the care of someone who is suffering from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or other forms of dementia. Um, we are very excited because Joe Cotto is coming down to Ludlow the 29th of April to do an in-person training to help people who want to facilitate memory cafes. The, this is a service that we offer so far, uh, Black River Good Neighbors Senior Solu has one in Ludlow. Senior Solutions now has one in three communities that we serve for two hours a month. It offers a free, safe place for people to come with their loved one who will be cared for, watched, you know, entertained, so that these caregivers have a short moment in time to support each other, learn about resources, find out they're not alone. And it's so needed, but it's scratching the surface. They're doing the work that isn't being done because there are not enough in-home caregivers. There are not enough facilities. There are not enough day adult service places that are affordable. We have people that come to the Memory Cafe who like we were just hearing, if they want respite, if they want to find a day facility, it's astronomical unless they have Medicaid. So we're going to be meeting with one of the day facilities on Friday, which is tomorrow, and we're going to try to work out some kind of a plan where we can help each other. But the state, I am just begging that the state do something to support the volunteer programs. These are people who are retired, most of them, and are going into the homes that are, are so necessary. And I worry that they are being expected to do the unconscionable and the impossible. Thank you very much. Thank you, 
Joanne, and um, I'd like to acknowledge that we do have um, you know, other uh, AAA representatives here. Our Older Americans Act work flows through these AAAs. Um, our Older American Act services are dementia services. That is a priority um, population. Is there anyone here, um, just as, as you're thinking of from our AAAs that would like to share what they need sort of from their role um, in providing those services? But we, after this one, go ahead. Hi, I'm Alicia Fleming, and I'm from Colchester, originally from St. Johnsbury. And <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about the destigmatizing of the disease and wrapping ourselves around early education in K through 12s and what that looks like so we can present a model that is truly, I'm still me. Uh, I support what you're saying. Um, I look at it as I have a new normal. What was normal for me before is not now. Um, but looking at early detection is, is an interesting process. I was diagnosed with pseudo depression. Um, and I knew it wasn't right. I knew I had something more than that. Um, and they started telling me it was all in my head. It, it just is we're trying to do something early, but I'm not sure the uh, medical f facilities have caught up to what's going on, um, mainly because it took a long time for me to get a diagnosis that I have vascular dementia due to open heart surgery. And at my age, it shouldn't have happened, and they just didn't seem to catch that. So I went through a lot of process to find that out. I had to go down to Dartmouth to get a final diagnosis, because here they had slotted me as being pseudodemented depression. So we need to have people understand what this is about, and also the fact that th what she has is, it's still me, is what I find is when people, I tell people I have that, they kind of say to me, well, that's it. What does he know? He can't do anything because he has dementia. It, to some extent, I have to change what I do to adapt to my new normal. But I can still do what I can do with the help of my wife and others. It, it makes a difference. But I don't think people understand that we're still the same people, but we have to do things differently because of our disease. Thank you for sharing that. I think that we pigeonhole everything, every diagnosis, every disease, and we just, when um, I have been for a long time a very big advocate for Greg, and I say, well, Greg has dementia, and immediately people think nursing home. No, there's not nursing home yet. That's not where we're at. We're going to keep pushing the envelope. We're going to keep exercising. We're going to keep doing all the things we need to do um, to keep that brain um, vital and happy and healthy. And I think people need to stigma, stop talking and pigeonholing everybody. Thank you. Daryl, if you'd like to come forward. Um, again, I'd like to hear some more from our service providers. Thank you, Karen. Um, you know. Okay, and that, that, that's okay. And we'll, we'll end with you guys after Daryl. Yep. Hi, this is quasi off topic. But it, my curiosity really popped up after everybody was talking. Where, relative to the rest of the states in America, does Vermont stand relative to what we're able to do, what we do do? I know that's a difficult question to an answer, but it's one that just came to me. And I think it's, it's just significant in a way of seeing where, you know, I'm always aware of how much I love living in Vermont and what a progressive state it is. And I want to be sure it still is, <laughs> you might say. Anyway, that's just uh, something I wanted to add. Thank you, Daryl. Moira, would you like to go? And then sure. we'll go. Thank you. Thank you. Moira Ennin from Senior Solutions. Um, I manage the res one of the respite grants, the dementia respite grant, and I think one of the problems caregivers has is finding a respite caregiver. One they trust, one they'll allow in their home. Uh, that is where the grant stops often. They want it, they filled out all the paperwork, now they need to find someone and they cannot find anybody. Thank you, Moira. Uh, do you want to come up from the back? And 
Yeah, I think. Um, my name is Valerie Lewis. I live here in Montpelier. I'm not a provider. I'm a caregiver of a mom with Alzheimer's. And I was late today because we're in the middle of an Alzheimer's crisis with our family. Um, I'd like to address a couple of things that were said. Um, one of the things that would have helped my mom early on uh, would have been adult daycare. There's none here in central Vermont. And one of the thoughts that I had about that issue is that we have a whole network of senior centers around the state. If we could pair up with senior centers who have volunteers, get some training, obviously there's more funding that would be needed, but we've already got the network, we've already got the facilities, and that would help some of the folks who are not quite as far down the road with the progression of the disease. To address the issue of the cost of facilities, um, we were accepted at two facilities, and we had the rug pulled out from under us at the last minute on one of them, and today we're removing all my mother's belongings from a facility in Shelburne um, because she was taken to the hospital after being there for two days. They will not take her back, and so right now she has no place to go. We've been caring for her at home for a year, and we are fried. We are just worn out. We could not get resources. We couldn't get help. One of the problems with these facilities that I think the state can address is that they advertise their memory care. And they will tell you that they will take everyone throughout the full range of the progression of the disease. And then when someone exhibits behavioral issues, they kick them out or say they won't take them back. Um, and that is, you know, when you've paid thousands of dollars, and I just wrote a check for over $23,000 two weeks ago, and my mom was there for two days. So um, there is a cost to doing things. There is, you also have to look at the cost of not doing things. And the cost of this disease to the individuals, the families, the community is, unconscionable and I just sent uh, a message on to Bernie Sanders to say that this is a national embarrassment and outrage um, and we really need to all advocate very hard for this because five years from now the rest of the baby boomers are coming along and are going to need help and it's just not there and to those of you who are service providers thank you for what you do it's very difficult and there just aren't enough of you and you're not probably paid anywhere near what your work is worth. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Dreschi from the Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging in St. Johnsbury in Newport. Um, like Moira, I would love a pot of trained vetted individuals to go into homes and work. Um, my caregivers would love the ability to get online and see a registry of vetted caregivers in their area <coughs> who are trained in dementia care. Um, I would love to see our primary care physicians, care coordinators in each caregiver's office. There is um, a co care coordinator. I would like to see them trained in dementia care the availability of services and to stop siloing people into just their, their services, um, looking at people in a person-centered approach as to, oh, that's my client. No, that's your client and that's her husband and that's his wife and that's his dad and her mom. And if we could start looking at people in a more person-centered approach as to a more dollar bill approach, it would be a beautiful world. Um, more understanding for communities, um, big corporations, Walmart, Shaw's, all of these places that it is mandatory that their people are trained in what does dementia look like. I would love to see our law enforcement and emergency medical services trained in what does a dementia crisis versus an opioid crisis look like. I would like to see AAAs opening up more services to people with younger onset dementia. 
I would like to see. <laughs> I can do this all day long. <laughs> I would like to see more clinical training for um, congregations, religious sects. I would like to see more inclusivity with the LGBTQ plus community because there's a lot of shame. What does veterans associated dementia look like as opposed to regular dementia? <laughs> um, what does a, what, I would like to see more research going into and funding going into what is dementia going to look like for somebody who does have an opioid and or addiction? What does um, alcohol addiction do to the brain and cause of dementia? Thank, thank you, Karen. I, <laughs> I, I just, I, you asked. <laughs> Yeah, um, but I think a lot of what you just spoke to is um, possible through our Dementia Friendly Vermont. Um, as Ed had mentioned, those are those sector specific. So any organization or um, community member here is interested in that, please reach out to Ed or I. Wonderful. Oh, perfect. Sorry for people whose hands are up. We're going to do a quick transition here because we're going to run out of time and we have such a great stuff that still needs to happen today. So keep those ideas coming. We are going to come back here after the State House. I hope most of you can come back here with us and we can continue to brainstorm. Um, and you also can always send a message to me. You have my email from this. Tiffany's email is available. I'll give it to you. Ed's email is available. We need to hear what you need. We need to hear this town's available. We need to hear in this location we need a space. We can, we can meet some of these needs. The needs that are harder to meet are how we're going to train people in primary care practices because, as was said, they have capacity issues and they also have to know about all these other things. So there's, there's a lot that we need and we know that and we appreciate this brainstorm on it. So what we're going to switch to real quick and uh, like people to just really, we're going to kind of popcorn as fast as we can. Like what are some of the things we can offer as advocates? And this is going to transition into a brainstorm that continues today. Um, and there's a poster back there. You see the sticky notes on your tables. If there's something you can offer, right? I can spread the word in my neighborhood, Meg. Burlington. I can, I can facilitate a support group. Meg, Burlington, right? So what, what can people offer? So support groups I'm hearing. People can raise their hands or they can popcorn stuff out, but what can we offer? Go ahead. Yeah. We have a support group in South Burlington. Anybody is welcome. It's called In Harmony. It's about 10 years old, and we, we are willing to give that information. Anybody would love to come. We break up in two separate groups, the, the group that has the disease and the group that is a support, um, a support care person. And we have two facilitators that both work in healthcare, and we just bounce our ideas back and forth and support one another in harmony. I'm Lori McKenna, Dementia Family Caregiver Center. One of the things that we've developed over the past two years has been a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. We are matching new caregivers with caregivers with lived experience, and we are happy to take this model to other parts of the state. If you uh, have any interest in starting this program uh, in your agency. Hi, I'm Tracy Van Hoven, Middlebury. Uh, my grandfather had Alzheimer's, my mother had Alzheimer's, was five years in a continuing care community. I work for LCB Senior Living in Middlebury. Uh, we also have a, a community in Shelburne, and so I'm here if the family wants to talk about if, if her mom was in our community in Shelburne. So I was a family paying for care for five years for my mom, and I know how expensive it is because I'm on the sales and marketing side. I also get a lot of people that come to us for support, and luckily Middlebury is a dementia family community, and so what's important, I do want to say, put a plug in for more communities to do dementia friendly, because we've created in Middlebury a whole network of support systems for everybody across as many levels as possible, and Pam, you were at the last meeting, we were there together at um, Eastview. Um, I do want to throw out that we also, every month, third uh, Wednesday of every month, we offer a dementia support group. We work very closely with Middlebury Elder Services, who has a project independence daycare. 
we're part of their programming there. <clears throat> Excuse me, the other thing I wanna offer is we do have a program called Walk in uh, Their Shoes. And we actually offer this in terms of an education at adult senior centers and other places that may wanna partake. Where we actually simulate what it's like for people living with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. So um, Meg has my contact information. I'm, ha I'm happy to offer that program where we can, okay? But I understand what's going on very close to it. Hi, I'm Rachel, and I'm happy to support with um, education and training for healthcare professionals and um, non-medical home care or professionals working in adult day programs. Thanks. John, why don't you come up to yeah, the mic? Uh, or it's not that long. No. <laughs> yeah, John Bowton. Um, I'm willing to, once I can finally get um, kind of estate planning all figured out, which is another hassle that I think really is important to to have mentioned earlier, perhaps, uh, because that comes at quite a shock if you haven't done estate planning. Um, but once I get that done, um, I'm happy to begin to work with you and perhaps um, form somewhere in the White River Junction area a peer-to-peer -peer, um, support system down there. So, thank you. I'll make I'll make that commitment. But I need to kind of wind down some other things first. So that that's that's exactly what we're talking about about these yellow sticky notes okay when we leave today i want that flyer in the back that says we're all's in this together i can dot 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 it's not a commitment that tomorrow you're doing it i want it to be covered with sticky notes of things that you as individuals can do with your name that i can read so i can put that together reach out to you or connect you or just remember, so in six months I can say, hey, you said you wanted to do this, do you still want to do it? That's what the sticky notes are for now, at the next break or this afternoon. Anything you think you can do or you can offer from what you've heard, it can be everything from I can wear a bracelet and talk in my community. We have bracelets on the back table. I can distribute memory cafe information. I can start a memory cafe. That's where we're going. So um, let's hear one or two more things and then I'm gonna give a breakthrough. We'll take these last two and then we'll talk about what's gonna happen this afternoon. Hi, um, the Vermont Alzheimer's Association has also made uh, two short movies with me and um, I would be happy to go to other communities with those movies. In my before times, I was a licensed clinical social worker, so I actually can help facilitate conversation um, using, the, using what I already have. Um, and I think those could be helpful to caregivers as well as people living with the dementia. So I am a certified senior advisor, and I'm happy to have a conversation to help navigate resources. If someone wants to sit down and have a conversation of what their person-centric care model and their goals would want to look like. And recently just met also um, up in Franklin County with the Northwestern um, medical center team and looking to start a support group up there as we found as I was um, navigating that area found that there is no support group in that entire county at this time and it was a major need um, that was expressed in several outlets through skilled rehabs and age well offices there and that the the messaging was still the same that they they have this need so we're going to take care of that need and get that going um, absolutely and and I thank you all for sharing everything that you have I think it really truly does take a village um, to make all of this happen and the more we can teach and learn from one another the more we can be empathetic to this disease and what it does not just to the person but to everyone it touches thank you Thank you so much, Alicia. We're actually going to stop it, but we'll keep we'll continue the sharing. But we're going to stop. I just want to say, like, echo what you say of like, I appreciate John saying when the time is right, I'll be a mentor. I'm just going to shout out for the Alzheimer's Association that we need community educators, we need support group facilitators, we train you. Joe's the one, but we train you, we support you, we hold your hands, we do everything. But we need those people in the community because you know your community. 
You know if your library is friendly or not. You know where the spaces are. So, And you don't have to have lived through this to be a facilitator. Many of our interns have had no experience. They're taught how to do this, and then they provide and hold space so people can come together and do what we're doing right here, which is saying, I have this, I need this, let's connect. It's a model that works, so we always need volunteers. Before I share what's happening this afternoon, I just want to invite Kylie Cooper to speak for one minute. She is our state ombudsman, and she's going to just, because a, a lot of you mentioned issues that are related to her work, and I just want her to be able to say hello so you know if you want to connect with her. Hello, so I'm with the Vermont Ombudsman Program at Vermont Legal Aid, and we advocate for individuals who are in long-term care facilities or who receive long-term care at home through the Choices for Care program. We are government funded, we're always free. We never, there's no chance that you're gonna be charged by calling us, so if you have issues in long-term care facilities or with the Choices for Care program at home, um, please contact us, we'd like to help. Thank you, Kylie. Okay, so this afternoon, it's going to be a little bit hectic and crazy for a little bit right now. So I'm going to hope that some people are going to remember what I say because I realize I should have drawn a map, but I didn't. So by 1240, all of you should be on the steps at the front of the State House. Over there, you will find your flower. We're going to bring them over there for you, and there will be a banner. And we're going to all meet there at 1240. And we're going to have a picture taken with legislators that come outside. And then together we'll go into the building and into the House chamber where Michael will give the devotional. You'll hear a resolution read. And eventually Representative Noise is going to say some stuff that you'll say, oh, that sounds familiar. And he's, he'll say, I'd like to recognize the people. And we're going to stand up and hold our flowers. Follow the leader. Uh, some of us have done it before and we'll know. That's what's going to happen. If possible, when you go, in case we get separated because we're going to be moving, there is an elevator in the State House. We're going to be on the first floor of the chamber, which is actually the second floor in the State House. So you'll need to take the elevator. You probably can follow Betsy and Jenny to the elevator if you need an elevator. Or when you go in, you're going to literally go up one flight of stairs. We're going to go in the door to the chamber, and we're going to sit on the right side until that's full, and then you can sit on the left side. But let's fill the right side first. Um, just to kind of create a critical mass. If there's no space there, you can sit anywhere you want. There's a gallery even on the third floor, which is the second floor of the State House. Everyone can go there. We don't have a specific plan for how to get to the State House. Howard is willing to drive people from here to there. It's a little less than one mile. It'll take you probably 10 minutes to slowly walk over there. So anyone who wants to walk over, um, some of us will walk. Howard's willing to drive people. I know Betsy and Jenny are driving. They may have space in their car. If you want to drive, there should be street parking in front of the State House, and you can just meet her and walk up to the front of the State House. So we're going to all move over there at our own pace. I'm going to leave a little bit quicker and take Michael with me and Jasmine because I want to introduce him to where he's doing the devotional. So after the floor, after we're recognized on the floor, and also everyone else is recognized, and believe me, there'll be people standing, recognizing their daughter, their granddaughter, their uncle, their school teacher. After all that happens and they ring the bowel, we're go gavel, we're going to go to the orders of the day. That's when we can all stand up and leave the house chamber and all kind of be going like, okay, let's go. You'll see it starting. And we'll leave, and then we have to get back here. So if you drove, drive back here. If you walked, we'll walk back here. And we will have snacks for you here. We have charcuterie boards to set up, and we have cookies. And we'll be doing two activities here, looking at sort of how do we want to stay connected and how do we want to work together through the summer non-legislative session, and also a little bit about sort of key takeaways from today and opportunity for people to continue to mingle. You can leave stuff in this room. This room is not locked, so I wouldn't leave my purse here, but you can leave your papers here if you're coming back or, or other things. Um, you can put your cups over by the sink or leave them on the table. We'll put them in the dishwasher and clean them out. Um, and we'll be here. We're going to try and start up around 2 o'clock again here, so we'll have about a half an hour to move from the State House back to here, and we'll be done by 3 o'clock this afternoon. All right, so who has any questions about how this part's going to work? All righty.
thank you everyone for coming. If anyone can't join us at the State House, we will miss you. And um, I will hopefully see most of you back here at two o'clock and I'll see you at the State House soon.